When I first heard her voice, it was the strangest thing ever that I felt like you know her. I felt a connection. I felt something like I'm actually physically feeling this, feeling my heart connected to this, a string connected to this person. Her voice brought me to a, a comfortable level. I was calmer. I was simply amazed. Who am I? 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 This is Who Am I Really? A podcast about adoptees that have located and connected with their biological family members. I'm Damon Davis, and today you're going to meet Barbara, who called me from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Barbara grew up an emotional child adopted by two refugees of war. When she found her birth mother, Barbara felt an immediate connection, struggled to get answers about her birth father, and uncovered lies about her origin story after the woman passed away. DNA helped Barbara locate her birth father, but the man refuses he may have been with her mother, so Barbara is left feeling lied to and disconnected from family members from every corner of her life. This is Barbara's journey. Before we really got into Barbara's story, she told me something valuable about the Who Am I Really podcast that I'd love to hear. She said she and her husband, Jim, have listened to the show together, and the experience has enlightened him on the impacts of Barbara's adoption on her. I have to say, though, so my husband's been starting to listen, and he's really been enjoying it oh, very yeah. much. Oh, that's good. It, it really is. It's it's brought us to a different level or he's seeing me in a different level now and we'll get in the car and he'll say this show we do we do you Mm -hmm. and we do sarah louise so we'll go which one we want and if we're going out to dinner somewhere it takes us half an hour he'll say can you can we listen to a podcast (laughs) oh (laughs) and it's it's helped him understand me more and he's trying to encourage our children to do it or or adult children for them to understand me Mm -hmm. as well and so it's just made a great connection between he and i of he's he's just really understanding oh you know what that sounds like you he sees the connection between all adoptees now and he understands and he can see the relationships and that's been just for me it's it is i'm gonna cry because it really makes me feel valued it makes me it makes me feel loved by him is really, and, and, really cool. and and to be understanding I'm, other... I'm glad you said that because this is also one of the hopes that i think many adoptee podcasters want is that we increase the allyship for the people around us right we don't want them yes. to just sort of say oh wow that's really interesting that that was your experience it's actually now our experience you're living with me and i am a result of this adoption experience and the way I feel, act, react, whatever, can be a result of what I've been through, be it the trauma, the joy, the misunderstanding, whatever. And so that ability mm-hmm. to sort of sit in it with you and listen and learn and make parallels and sort of, it sounds like he's thinking about it even when you're not listening, is really incredible. And that's, I think, what a lot of adoptees want is for the people around us to go, Oh, now I understand you a little bit better. That's super, super cool. He he even talked before I started here in this morning of how how you you take it for granted. He says, I just now I understand how I I take my family for granted. That's my mom and dad. Yes, I understand that. And for a non adoptee to say, Okay, I, I see your point of view. I see that you how you're disconnected. Whereas you know, he sees he's been through the journey of yeah, I can see where you know how, how how you were feeling. I can see where the disconnection is. But for for non adoptees to listen in on and understand us. That's really, really cool. Well, tell <laughs> him I said thanks for listening and for being a good supporter <laughs> to you. I mean, you got emotional about it, which is an indication yeah, of how yeah. important it was. That's really, really cool. He has been the greatest supporter of all of this. He has been wonderful. He has been supportive and stood by me and he said we're in this together we're, we're a team we're, we're doing this doing this together and i greatly appreciate that mm-hmm. i i can't i can't say enough about my husband jim he is just 
He is phenomenal. Way to go, Jim. Love it. <laughs> Barbara was born in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Then her family moved to Celine, where she grew up. Her adoptive mother was Yugoslavian, and her adoptive father was Polish. After World War II, both found themselves in England, where they met. They immigrated to the United States in 1956, and her mom found a job as a labor and delivery nurse in Ypsilanti. Then she befriended the head of obstetrics in the hospital, where Barbara was born. Barbara's adoptive mother was also a patient of the chief OB, who knew of their desire to adopt a child. The doctor had a 19-year-old patient who wished to place her child for adoption. When the doctor asked Barbara's parents if they were interested in the baby he would soon deliver, they said yes, they were. The doctor had his lawyer draw up adoption papers and oversaw the whole process. He paid for everything. He took care of my parents. And, and so that's how I came to be. And so my birth mother, who I call Kay, has, have always called her Kay. Yes, she was 19. She was kicked out of her home and she told her parents she was pregnant. She lived in the Detroit suburb. And in those days, I guess, that her parents were very embarrassed. And, and so they said they were going to send her to a, the unwed mother's home. Kay had an older sister who was seven years older and at the time was married. And my uncle had said, that is not going to happen. She's not going to a, a home. She's going to come live with us. Mm. <laughs> to my, which my aunt said, oh, I, they already had an 18-month-old child. So that's what they did. They took Kay in. Mm. So she lived with them, and, and, and then she saw Dr. Elliot. And so they shared the OB. And so that's how I was born in that hospital mm. where my mother, my mother had worked. Barbara's family moved to her small rural town of Saline, Michigan, which she described as Rockwellian in its idyllic appearance. There was a five-and-dime convenience store. She walked home through town from school, and the annual holiday parades went right down Main Street. Barbara had a good life with her parents and her grandmother, who lived with them, and was also of Eastern European descent. And so by the time I was five, I did not speak English. I only spoke German. So I, when I started kindergarten, I had to learn English. <laughs> so wow, I, really? that was... Yeah, because I was with my Oma all day, and so I didn't, and there were other kids, but they were older, and I didn't have anybody to play with, and I didn't go to preschool or anything like that, so my my grandmother took care of me during the day, and so I, yeah, had learned English. That's so um, interesting. This I, I'm glad you brought this up, because I was going to ask about the experience of living with your parents. They were of Polish and Yugoslavian descent. And mm -hmm. they immigrated to the United States post-war. And mm -hmm. I was just kind of thinking, I wonder what their experience was like as immigrants into, you know, middle America. And now they've brought right. over, you know, her mother. So they've created sort of a, a cohesive little unit of immigrants who are probably finding their way together in America. And it was just so interesting to hear you say that you didn't learn to speak English until, you know, much later than most American children do. It's just fascinating. It, it really is. And I don't know the story of why my grandmother came. I know that my parents were here you know, for maybe four or five years before my grandmother came. And so my, my parents, they didn't talk a lot about their life. I mean, the, it's, I had pictures they had of what life was like in, in England because they married in 50. And came over in 56 so they had some time over there they just don't never did talk about what life was like or what it, what it was or they're just very closed off on, on things like that um you know i wish they were a little bit more open but it was good i mean i and and, and actually damn it as i get older you kind of have the cultural differences coming into play as as in a teenager as a girl that my mother didn't understand, doesn't understand dances, didn't understand makeup, didn't understand. My mother left home at 16. She just could not take care of her. She was, they lived in a farm. She didn't want to take care of her sisters. That's all she had to do. At one point, I think she kind of said in between lines that she had to leave school to take care of her younger siblings. Oh. And, and, you know, we, you don't knit, we don't sew, we don't do anything. And my mother just didn't, didn't care for that. Just felt, I think suppressed and so she so she left home 
and that could be part of taking my grandmother on i think of the the guilt possibly i just remember my mother doing it a, a lot um, as a youngster mother reading a lot she read i mean she read all she read roots she just was so interested in reading and she was sewing and she was all of that and up so culturally wise I think she tried to do the best they could, but it became a, a little bit difficult for me as a teenager. So you talked a little bit about sort of, you know, this teenage experience in America of music and fashion and makeup and <laughs> yeah. all this stuff. And she totally wasn't mm -hmm. into it. So you guys, it sounds like probably clashed. And I would imagine to, as typically parents do, like even parents who grew up here can't even imagine what these young ladies wear today. <laughs> Like I see people yes. walking down the street and I'm like, oh my God, if that was my daughter, I would be so sad like that she's worn her whole body out for the world to see. So I'm sure that her experience was similar to yours, but just in different ways. Mm -hmm. Your experience back then was similar to the experience that I'm talking about now. Yeah, I I, I can see that. Yeah, I can I can see that. It, it was, it was, uh, we just couldn't seem to connect to her. Everything was wonderful until you get to, you know, about 12 or 13. And How did you get along otherwise, though? What were your sort of personality characteristics with your dad and with your mom? I would say we were kind of opposites on things. I, so I was more, I'm not going to call it spirited, but I had more passion, more chutzpah. And me, whereas my parents downplayed, no, 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 no. You know, maybe my mother would say mouthpiece, mouthpiece, don't, don't say that. And it, it was more of that. It was, yeah, it was... Uh, a little different personalities, but uh, I would say, I mean, we got, we got along very well, or I got along with my dad, as long as I was the little girl. To him, I was his little baby, little girl, and everything was fine. You know, I got along with them, and, but I, I mean, if I was curious, it would be squelched. No, don't, you know, don't worry about that. Or the family dog, you know, I was a Girl Scouts, and I was, must have been nine. And the, well, where's, where's Ginger? Oh, well, you know, we, we had to put her down. Like, that was yesterday? <laughs> you didn't tell me that. Oh, wow. so, so it was kind of like that, where they're just, you know, if you were curious, if I was, I'm a, I was very curious, and you, it, just a lot of it was suppressed. You know, you don't do that. You don't, you don't talk about that. And so, and affection-wise, I was opposite than my parents. My parents, I never saw affection with each other. I mean, and probably it was maybe because my grandmother lived with us, but I didn't have, I didn't see them hugging or kissing or doing things like that or sitting next to each other on the couch watching TV. They, they didn't do any of that. They didn't, I didn't have any of that. So it was a little bit different, whereas I, I'm more of a, I'm more affectionate. I, I crave, uh, Mama, do you, do you love me? I'm insecure. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. And, but not a lot of, kisses and hugs as I got older, like getting close to 10, nothing like, wasn't like that. I'm sure there was a little bit, but it, it wasn't a, an affectionate, whereas I'm, oh, I'm just in it. I just need that, need the affirmation. I just, do you love me? I want hugs. So we know we got along very well, but there were certain things of that, of emotions, passions. I'm passionate. You know, if I, if I, somebody put me a, a you know, to do strike something or protest something, I would have been there. Yes, you know, absolutely. Whereas my parents have don't make waves. And, mm -hmm. and I understand because of where they came from. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you about that. I, and I'm, you know, I was just having this conversation last night. I was going to say, I don't want to be stereotypical, but stereotypes exist for a reason, right? Because someone has experienced a thing more than once with a certain group of people. And I was wondering if you thought that their post-war experience in the two, especially the two countries that they came from, Pol Poland and Yugoslavia, sort of made them who they were in terms of lacking affection. I can't help thinking that they were probably very much in survival mode in much of their life, and affection was possibly not necessarily a priority as much as like getting through day to day and that probably translated into who they were as adults. Is that at all correct? Did you, as in, in hindsight, do you see some of that or am I off base? Do you I was, I would say absolutely. 
absolutely spot on because if my mother loved home at 16 wasn't there wasn't an affection in the, in the house and yeah. and then my father i think he finally kind of told me or was i guess his mother had died at childbirth giving birth to him and so my father his father had remarried and so there's not there wasn't a lot of probably affection with stepmother mm -hmm. and and especially what they have endured my father was in the polish army and my mother was in the red cross and so what they probably saw and had to endure i understand they did look like they had a good life in england of going with friends and, and bands and dancing but it became who they were with coming to to america and mother my mother kind of saying to me that they did try looking for a house in ann arbor and basically turned away because they were immigrants you know that that so they never make waves we don't say anything we just so that is absolutely true is that that morphed into who they were but to be told that that you know no you can't buy a house here because who you are and with my father and his broken english it is it is stereotypical it is they just learn not to to say anything just enjoying life or just being content mm -hmm. you know probably is that and emotions was not a factor into our family yeah well, it hadn't I mean, been part not. of the survival formula and so that's not something they were able to transfer and convey to you barbara's grandmother living in the home added some complexity to the family dynamic barbara occasionally felt guilt trips against her own desires when she was a kid all barbara wanted was a vacation so her parents took her to florida unfortunately her grandmother locked herself out of their house and the neighbor's son had to crawl in the basement window to let her in. That mishap laid the groundwork for a guilt trip for leaving her behind while the family went on vacation, and their family never took another vacation again. Barbara said her parents used to have music playing in their home through a huge radio, but her grandmother complained about it, and the music stopped. The vibe in their family was dictated by her grandmother's feelings. Since Barbara was spending so much time speaking German at home, she was behind as a student in English-speaking schools. Her teachers told her parents that she needed books, flashcards, and games to provide additional support speaking English at home to start forming sentences in English in order to even be able to communicate in class. Barbara recalled the show Sesame Street was a huge help when it debuted on television. I was curious about how adoption was portrayed in Barbara's household when she was a child. She didn't know what adoption was until she was about nine years old. She used to love to try on her mother's shoes, so Barbara would be in and out of her closet when her mother wasn't looking. One day, when she was home from school for a snow day, Barbara noticed a box underneath a sweater on the top shelf. So I pulled it out, and I opened it up, and there was this book, and it said, All About Me. Huh. Oh. So I took it out, and I started looking in it, and it was... The day that you came home, here's a picture of them have holding me, my mother in a, in a car, and what what the day was like. And oh, this is my baby book. Well, isn't that, that's interesting. And I'm just looking through, it and there's dates, and there's a picture of this couple uh, holding me in front of this in their house. And oh, wow, what is this? Is, oh, this is about me. And you know, the, the, you know, your walking steps when you first got teeth, and you know, and the visitors that came to see you, and I'm like, who's that? Oh, I all these people I don't know. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, me, I better put this back, and I put the put the book back in the box, and put it back on the on the shelf. And then um, days so days later, my mother comes to me, and so she discovered that uh, she found that I found the box, and wanted to confront me with it, and she said, did you? did you find this and, and i said so i guess it must have been yes I, I don't remember clearly but i do remember her sitting me down and saying well let's let me, let me talk about it like who is this you know she's sort of telling me who these people are and just how happy when we brought you home it's like home from where i mean, i don't know i never asked like where did i come home what, i came home from where where did you pick me up that wasn't discussed but i was very intrigued by it though but they weren't forthcoming of stories or weren't saying anything. Like if I asked a question, well, you know, I mean, I just don't remember, or you know, or she wasn't divulging more information, giving me any stories anymore. I was very inquisitive. 
<laughs> you know, what is this all about? So I think I was intrigued by me, just seeing pictures of of me, of, oh, that's really that's really cool. Oh, that's really interesting. But, but it doesn't uh, sound yeah. like from this conversation that they, as you said, were not forthcoming. And does it, did they actually reveal that you were adopted? Well, yeah. I mean, it was, the book was revealing. They didn't, she didn't come out and say it, but it was, yeah. So this is one of those special baby books that it's all about me you know, the, the adopted child. And that word wasn't there. It was how you how you came to us. Mm -hmm. You were able to deduce from the language that she used that you were adopted. And did you know what adoption was or did you just kind of put it together but weren't didn't have the language to understand completely what it meant? I put it together by the pictures and by what it was saying in this book. The adopted self. Oh. Huh. This is the adopted self. And so she didn't come out and say, uh, you know, I, I didn't have you. I didn't, you weren't born to us. She was trying to be open-minded, but not very good at the language. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm making my own deductions and I'm, I'm discovering myself of, you know, w w what this means. Cause I'm looking and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't look like my dad. I don't look like my mom. I don't look like my grandma. I don't look like my cousins that are sitting there. So it, it just wasn't. It wasn't said that, you know, someone else that, you know, we didn't bring you home from the hospital was how you came to us. <laughs> That's how it was. It was, I think it was almost like, don't worry about it. She's too young to understand. Will you tell me quickly, how did you look differently from your parents? You mentioned that in passing. How, what was the differences? As I grew up, my hair was naturally curly. It was big. <laughs> it was bulbous. And I had my mother, very straight brown hair, very straight. My father had very straight dark hair as he's balding. I'm more of a longish face. It just, I, my appearance was very, it was, was different. It was, yes, very dark, curly hair. And whereas, you know, <laughs> No, my parents and yeah, nobody has hair like this. Nobody has natural curly hair like this. It was just, and so I guess I didn't really pick up on it, but I, the more I did, and I, I guess I really didn't say, oh, that, you know, I didn't think of it being very different. And again, I lived just happily. <laughs> I was just a happy kid just right. going along. When Barbara was 12, a physician in the hospital was being sued for malpractice. Her mother had to bring home some documents to review, and among them was a ledger book. Barbara opened it up where she found that Dr. Elliot, the man who brokered her adoption, recorded every birth that happened at the hospital. There were columns for mother's name, last name, and maiden name. Scrolling through the entries, Barbara saw her birthday, December 3rd. But on that day, there was only one entry that did not have a maiden name. And I see the name. And I thought, I bet that's her. I don't know. I don't know why I was thinking of that. I always thought of, oh, you know, I know I don't belong to them, but belong to somebody else. Could this be, could this be the woman that gave birth to me? I mean, could this, could this be on this date? And so her name had been ingrained in my mind always. Hmm. And I'm turning 16. And I said to my mother, do you think she thinks about me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure she does. Shots. I'm sure she, oh, I'm sure she does. And I don't reveal to my parents that I think I know her name. I never do, divulged it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm 18. I don't say anything. And then when I was 25, I just, I started having the feeling, I don't know what it was. It came over me of, I think I'd like to find her. And so I, I remember my mother saying, sometimes would say, well, you know, they thought rumor had it. Again, my mother working in the hospital, still being friends with the OB, Dr. Elliot. And I, I don't know, it was a rumor, but oh, that she went to Eastern Michigan University. And so when I was born, I had this really large um, birthmark on my left calf. And so my parents had that removed because they were afraid that my father working had worked at Eastern Michigan, that she would spot me on campus if uh, my parents' mother would bring me there. Wow. So, they had the, so they had that removed because they were afraid if they're walking around, because it was a very easy birthmark, and they were, and then she would come back and get me, mm -hmm. and they were afraid that, that that she would see me and that and she would feel differently and would want me back. So they so they had that removed, and 
coming forward now as I'm turning 25, I'm really having that itch. I think I'm, God, it's like I really want, I think I really like to find her. Barbara didn't say anything to her parents when she went to the Ypsilanti area. At the library, she shared that she was adopted, she was searching for her birth mother, and she wanted to look through yearbooks. Looking for a 19-year-old by the name she had memorized, Barbara didn't find anything. She didn't tell anyone in her life that she was searching. Barbara wanted to maintain the search as her secret. Next, Barbara called Catholic Social Services. The social worker told her the records are closed. She had fallen into a donut hole of inaccessibility in Michigan. Barbara asked, Well, is there any other way, do you think? Like, are you going to hire somebody? Or, And she said, you know what? If you don't want to do the legwork yourself, you really don't want to go find her. Oh, wow. Click. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> right? The second door closed, and I, uh, and I just lost aspirations. This organization was not going to be kind to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, or, you know, there's no way, or, you know, you do it yourself. And I go, okay, so, all right, fine. So that, that kind of closed the door on me. I go, well, that just, I'm, I'm too busy for it anyway then. You know, I'm, I'm 25, I've got a good job, I'm, I'm, I'm married, and, you know, I'm saving for a house. So just life was going on, just life. And then I was kind of approaching my 30th birthday, and I thought, you know what, I, I don't know. I, I really like to know before I have children. And so my husband had a coworker who had divulged to him that I think on the striking conversation that she had given a child up for adoption. And then, and so she and I kind of connected and we thought we'd go to a support group together. Before meeting her new friend, Barbara had no idea how to even begin a search. The internet wasn't a big deal yet, but she found a database called People Finder, curated by a man named David Gray. The information he curated in the database was segregated by state, so Barbara searched Michigan, posted her adoption story, and hoped for a connection. Barbara received a message back from another woman in Washtenaw County, Michigan, who let her know that she could petition the court for her information, and she could try to get a court-appointed confidential intermediary, or a CI, to help her search. The CI is allowed to go into an adoptee's records and make copies for the search. Then try to locate the birth parents acting as the intermediary between the adopted person and their newly found family. Barbara decided it was time to share her desire to search for her birth family with her adoptive parents. I went to my parents and I said, this is what I'd like to do. And I said, I also know her name. <laughs> and my mother said, well, how did you find out? And I told her the story. And my mother said, hmm. well, you were always a very precocious child. <laughs> And, so, and she said, I'm, I'm not surprised. You were very, my mother said, if there was a box wrapped up on the middle of the dining room table, sooner or later, that box is going to get unwrapped. I just could not stand not knowing something, secrets or, you know, so she said, you, I'm not surprised. Just, you know, and after my finding my All About Me book, so I told, told them what, what it entailed. My parents called me one day and said, we'd like to have lunch with you. And they slid money across the table in this envelope, and they paid. They paid for the the confidential intermediary, which was two hundred and fifty dollars. So I had to pay the court of Washtenaw County twenty five dollar filing fee and two hundred fifty dollars to hire this person who I had chosen. And that's how I began with hiring her CI, which I I won't I won't divulge her name for reasons I'll tell you. But that's how it all began was she went into my files. And so here I am, I've just turned 30 and yeah, it's time. You know, I, this is another circumstance just like today of let's just do it. You know what? I've, I'm, I've committed, you know, let's just put them, let's send the money in before I lose faith, mm -hmm. before I just give up and get very scared. And I, and I did go to my husband and I said, this, we're on this path. Are, are you okay with it? And he was very much so. And so were my parents. My parents said, yes, we, we're okay. We know you love us. And I said, you were, excuse me, David, you will always be my parents. You will always. Because um, they, were, they were there for everything. Right. And you will always be my parents. And you are mom and dad to me. This is an, a really important point about adoptive parents being supportive <laughs> is having it in their own heart to know, I know you love me. 
and that allowed them to be in a position of supporting you with this journey. A lot of adoptive parents struggle with supporting the journey, and I wonder how much the insecurity of not necessarily knowing how much they're loved comes into play in that scenario. We try to help them understand how much we love them and how much we appreciate them. But for whatever reason, it still continues to be a question for some adoptive parents. And I'm glad that they said that to you. We know you love us. That's really important. They were also older. I mean, when my parents adopted me, my mother was 40, my father was 42. And at this point, they're in their early 60s and they know. My mother helped me with a great wedding, who, by the way, and the side note is that when I was 22, my mother was in this study group. And one day she came home and she said, well, I met this other woman who, and she adopted as well. And I guess the state of Michigan now has this database where you can submit to see if if your birth mother put her name in the database and you guys can connect. And I remember looking at this piece of paper and handing it back to my mom. And I said, or maybe I did. I I said, I I don't have time for this. I I don't, I don't want to No, This is, whoa, this is too much because I finally was connecting with my mother in another level. Finally, we, we were we having a great time planning this wedding together, and it was great. So I was thrilled that I'm having I'm reconnecting with my mom, and you want to throw this in. This is it was just too much for me. So at this moment in time, when I'm when they're giving me the money, I think that they know what all the experiences that we've had together. They know they they are comfortable and confident. We've been through this journey. I am very fortunate in that. Uh, It was very unique to have my parents feel this way. Very unique. The court signed off on Barbara C.I. getting access to her records on a Friday morning. In her records, the C.I. found that her birth mother had a brother about five years older than herself. So she called the man to start the search, opening by saying she's doing some research. The man asked if her research was regarding wills and estates thinking the call he was receiving was about his father's estate, as the man had passed away a few years prior. The CI said, well, kind of. Barbara's paternal uncle then provided his sister's number and her new married last name to the CI. The confidential intermediary called Barbara's birth mother, identified herself as a representative of the court, and asked, Did you give up a daughter on December 3rd, 1966? And she says, yes. And and CI says, well, she is looking for you. And to this point, she says, can I can I talk to her right now? And CI says, no, but let me. I need to confirm and that it is you. And she says, does she still have that birthmark on her left left leg? CI says, I'll get back with you. Let me talk to her. And the CI calls me and says, I did find her. And she wants to know if you still have that birthmark on your left leg. And their tears are coming. And I know it is her. And I said, no, but that's that's my birth mom. Yeah. And, and I'm just sobbing. I'm just sobbing. And the CI says, why are you crying? And I, I said, because it's real. I said, that it's no longer on this paper that you actually are hearing her, that she really is out there, that she, that she wants to communicate to me and just... And the CI says, I just don't get you adoptees. Oh. And I said, I didn't respond to that. I, I didn't know what to say to that. And so I, I said, yes, you know, you can, you can give her my, my phone number and, and my name. You can give her my name. And so the CI calls me back and says that she does. And she wants to talk to you on Sunday evening. And then I said, well, this is great. Oh, wonderful. So I have waited all weekend. Yeah, to talk to her. And then she called on Sunday evening. How was your call? When I first heard her voice, it was the strangest thing ever that I felt like you know her. I felt a connection. I felt something like I'm actually physically feeling this, feeling my heart connected to this, a string connected to this person. Her voice brought me to a, a comfortable level. I was calmer. I was simply amazed that I felt a connection with this person without having to touch them. Mm -hmm. It was the voice, and we spoke for three hours. Wow. Just, it was a a little bit about me and about her, and just, 
and her feelings of I've I've always wanted to f- to find you. Every year on your birthday, I light a candle, and then you know, and I had asked her, "Can I ask about my my birth father?" And she said, "Well, he he died in Vietnam." After three hours on the phone, Barbara and her birth mother said goodnight and hung up. It was 1997, and we weren't at the point where everyone had a computer at home and easy access to email. So Barbara's birth mother started emailing her husband, Jim, at work, sending messages to Barbara. It wasn't long before Barbara's husband started advocating for a computer at their house so Barbara could connect directly with her birth mother. The women emailed back and forth a lot, and her birth mother shared their reunion with her own sister, Judy, Barbara's aunt, and her niece, Lisa who sent emails to Barbara, introducing themselves and welcoming Barbara into the family. Barbara learned that she has two half-brothers who are 9 and 12 years her junior. Her birth mother said the family had some unoccupied time on their calendar and they wanted to make travel plans to visit Barbara for their first meeting. While she was at work, Barbara tried to find a hotel room for her newfound family to stay at in town, but they were all booked up. Barbara went home crying to Jim, who had the solution. Barbara's birth mother's family would simply have to stay with them. The reunion went well at first. So Kay's husband, Bob, and Jim go off to get pizza, and Kay says, do you have a bottle? Do you have any wine? And I said, oh, why have you got a bottle of wine? Yeah, I pulled out the wine here. Sips and she said, I, I have something to disclose to you. I need to reveal something. Your father did not die in Vietnam. We'll just call him, quote unquote, Fred. And I was at the city where Fred lives and I confronted him that we had a child together. And he says, We did not, we did not. He denied it, denied it. It's not mine, it's not mine. And so she said, You know, so I left and she said, I'm only telling you this because I don't. I'm not giving you his name or where he lives because I don't want you to be hurt because he's going to deny it. So years later, Kay's husband is in the same city where he lives and he confronts Fred and says, you know, you had a child together. You know, Kay just wants you to acknowledge the child. And he said, I can't. It's not mine. It's not mine. And he's denying it, denying it. And um, so that was that. And so she said, that's that's how I'll leave it. And it's too painful for me. And uh, well, all right, and so I don't, I don't think about it because at this point, for me, I, I'm already overwhelmed with this new person, this person that's now added two pieces of my puzzle, who I feel connected to. My my world felt smaller, I felt changed, I felt elated, I felt I am looking, excuse me, I'm looking at a face that looks familiar to me. Somebody talks like me. Her mannerisms are like me. I felt like I'm I'm part of the, you know, the world just felt brighter, you know, it just felt I just felt like I'm 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 part of the world. I'm not just floating somewhere. I'm not tethered to nobody. This person, her 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 voice inflections, her hands talking and and that's me. <laughs> she has very straight hair, but it's my hair is very different than hers, but it's somewhat me. Or to hear her say, oh, you've got the chin. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, I, 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 I'm somebody. You know, you, you feel like you're someone. And I didn't dwell on the other half of that, of the, the paternal side. I didn't, wasn't even thinking of it. But to be connected with someone else, it, it was wonderful. Mm-hmm. For me, it was I, I can't even describe it. The words just can't describe those intense feelings in your heart. You just feel <laughs> plugged into someone else. You're just connected to someone else. Barbara's birth mother only brought her husband, Bob, on the trip. Her half-brothers didn't know about her existence yet. When her birth mother flew home, she told her sons about the reunion she had just had with Barbara. But the weekend Kay left, Barbara also had to leave town for a trade show in Florida. So her husband, Jim, drove Barbara, Kay, and Bob to the airport. Unfortunately, Barbara had no time after the emotionally charged weekend to decompress with her husband and start to unpack her feelings. The only person Barbara could talk to was a co-worker on the trip, who slid her a glass of wine out of empathy for what he had heard in her story. 
Barbara wished she had had a proper outlet for her feelings because she felt like she was an emotional mess. When Barbara returned from her trip, one of her half-brothers had sent her a message welcoming her to the family. Later that year, Barbara's husband Jim surprised her with a birthday trip to see her birth mother on the East Coast. Everyone had a wonderful weekend in New York City. The next year, 1998, started with Barbara discovering she was pregnant with her son. Her birth mother Kay came out for the baby shower and was very nice to Barbara's adoptive parents. So they came out and they invited my parents over for coffee and my parents and Kay and Bob just got along so well. Just even my father walked up to Bob and said, and shook his hand and he said, you know, thank you for your service in Vietnam. And Bob was stunned. He, he said he'd never had that before hmm. where somebody was actually thanking him for, for that. Just, he just said, they just got along very well. And, and at some point my father must have just said something to Kay, if you know, about, you know, you, you mom and, and Kay, her, she put her hand on his shoulder and she said, Andrew, I am Kay, just Kay. That over there is mom. That's mom. I'm just Kay. And that's how it always was after that. If he had to understand the, the labels, like the, the feelings that were going on or how, how she was, how Kay was training, it was, I'm just Kay. So after that, it would, whenever they came into town, my parents would come over, they would see my parents and everything. They really, they got along wonderfully. Hmm. But, and I just had a, a thought too of the first time my parents, when I, when Kay came into town, I took them over to see my parents again, back, back in this, sorry, I'm sorry, flipping around uh, in, in, in May of 97, when I took them to my parents' house and my mom and Kay were hugging and Kay stepped back and she looked at my mother and said, you were holding me, weren't you, during labor when I was in labor? And my mother said, yes. And uh, I, I stood there offside another secret well, why didn't anybody why didn't you just tell me see again it was i feel like things are so, so shrouded and, and secret so i never knew that why didn't you when i asked you what she looked like well i'm you know i really don't remember why why is that and i had no idea so from the time i was born on the third until the ninth when Kay had to come back and and hand me off to the law the lawyer to take me to the foster home, I'm, I'm, I'm in the nursery where my mother's working. <laughs> that hit me of, so you you saw me. I mean, you saw me in the nursery and yet you're still working. It, the, these secrets of, yeah, you know, wait a minute here. So for, for those six days, do you know that, that I'm in that nursery? And you know what's going on because you know that Dr. Elliot's saying, this is the child. This is who you're adopting. And my mother's just going along, working. Wow. Very odd. Yeah, so like little little secrets here and there coming out. And she continued to oh. work in that nursery after your birth. Is that right? She did, and she retired from Bayer. She retired from that hospital. But so she never I, revealed to you that she was part of your birth and worked in the nursery where you were born. That's really interesting. Correct. Yep. I mean, I, mean, I hear stories of uh, as a labor and delivery nurse, so... And I know there's somebody who's also in the nursery, but yes, these little, little secrets coming out <laughs> as I'm older here. How interesting. I don't know how, they, how else to put it. Very, very interesting. And so we're coming back now to after my son form, the, the visiting. And then in, I think, year, year 2000. So at this point, after my son, she would come out and she would come into the inner bar fair. We would do that. She'd come out for like a long week. Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, it, it was very nice. And looking back at it, I thought, I think it was wonderful. But she really didn't, she didn't really ask about me. There's a lot of stories about her and, and the boys and everything they've been doing. And then come year 2000, um, she had come from the art fair and revealed that she had, um, I found a lump. She had breast cancer. And, but, but she's just did a lumpectomy. And then I found out I was pregnant with my daughter at the end of 2000. And then 2001, I, I had my, I had my daughter. And then my mother had suddenly passed in November of 2001. And I had asked Cave, maybe, you know, can you, can you come out? And um, two days after my mother passed, my father had a more major heart attack. It was um, so 
he was in the hospital. I had moved back in with my parents to take care of my dad after I, after my mother died. And so I was the one who called my father middle of the night and sorry. So like, yeah, he was, he was in the hospital and I'm only 34 years old and I have both my kids. And I, I think I just even said, you know, I could really use some help. And well, I know I, let me, let me yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I, I have time and my in-laws, well, they weren't the greatest of support either. And um, so it was just kind of my husband and I. And then in 2002, my father had passed in April. And here we had a two-story house that I had to clean and take care of. And again, I'm, I'm kind of asking Kay. And, you know, she says she consulted with a friend of hers who was in social work. And, you know, maybe I'll just, I'll just send you some flowers. And so there was nothing. Okay. Uh, okay. So... I basically taking care of everything myself. I, I think that they came out again, she and Bob. I mean, everything seemed, you know, wonderful. 2003 then to decide, actually, you know, I, I, we have to go to California to a, my half-brother's wedding. And the relationship seems really good. We're, you know, we're calling and she's talking. We're, she wants to know how the kids are doing. And But the beginning of 2003, I think it's February, she calls and says, you know, I'm, we're all sick, and we've got the flu. And she says, "Can I come?" And I said, "Oh, oh, oh, God, you know, oh, absolutely." You know, here it was in the beginning of 2003, and I'm—I don't know—we're still cleaning up my parents' house, having to go through probate, raising my kids, trying to get the son into a preschool, and doing doing things. And and she had come for the long weekend and brought brought presents for the kids. And my son is just overjoyed. Look what grandma got me. And Kirsten got this beautiful sweater and just, you know, they just, we can you know, just connected. And she said, you know, why don't you and Jim go out for dinner? Oh, oh my God, really? <laughs> I haven't been out to dinner with Jim in years, you know, <laughs> just the two of us. And grandma watched and then we came home and AJ said, grandma made us pizza. And he said, she let me eat the salami. And then just the, just a connection. Just loving grandma, just loving grandma. Grandma T is just the best. They really were having, were loving it. And, and in September, we had to go to California to meet, my, see my half, half brother. And I guess I should back up a little bit and say when I was pregnant with AJ in May of 98, we flew out to meet the boys. And, and that was, and it was nice. It was very nice. But at the end of the weekend, I did still felt they're very nice people. Don't get me wrong. But nobody asked about me, mm. like my experiences. So the whole weekend was all about all of their adventures, their trips, or things about them. The whole weekend, it wasn't. Well, what what was your you know what what did you do with growing up? What kind of things did you do? Oh, I you know I didn't get to share like my my ballet or that I played the flute or did anything like that. So there was nothing like that. There was no no questions about my background or me. What am I like? What did I take vacations or your nothing world. about me? Yeah. So they really weren't interested. And and I think, and I apologize, Damon, sidestepping again, as when I first met Kay that weekend, I had, um, I brought up some, uh, photo albums of me, even as growing up as a teenager. And that weekend in May of 97, and, and Kay wanted nothing to do with it. She just, she's close about, she said, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. And I, I felt a little, a little hurt. I want to share you with you how wonderful my life is, of who I was, who I am. I want to show you this is all part of me. This is who I am, and you want nothing to do with it. And I'm supposed to feel sorry for you of your feelings that you I can't deal with this. But you can't deal with that. You don't want to know me. You didn't want to get to know me. So that's how I, it was. Kind of a layer. This was another layer on top of nobody's interested in in me. In December of 2003. Barbara went east again to see her birth mother, who got tickets to the Rockettes in their famous Christmas show. Barbara had shipped toys and gifts ahead of her trip to her birth mother's house, and everyone had a wonderful holiday season there. Barbara said her brothers were very nice to her, and they introduced her to other people as their sister with no hesitation. That action really gave her a good feeling of acceptance. Barbara said whenever she and Kay got together, they always drank wine. As Barbara was getting older, she couldn't hang with the constant filling of her wine glass. 
the hangovers were just too much. Back home, Barbara sold her parents' house, her childhood home, and it was an emotional time of closure. In August of 2006, Barbara received a call from a maternal cousin who told her her birth mother wanted to talk with her. So when I call Kate, alcoholics seem to do this. Is they, when they talk, it's like a tape recorder. They start with a story, 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 and then it loops around. And the story, 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 and then loops around and comes back. And you feel like you're in this perpetual loop, right? And that was the beginning of what's going on here? Okay. Hmm. Because after the after that, when she, her phone calls were more in the evenings, and she was doing the same tape thing in 2007, you know, I, I said they wanted to come visit. I had major issues in my home, in this new home, and I said, I can't have you here. And she was so upset and yelled and and, don't, and, and then hung up on me. And after that, it would be the same, well, we were cordial emailing. She's sending gifts to the kids for Christmas. And then in 2008, I said, you know, she said, well, we, we'd like to come. We'll come on a Friday and we're going to leave on Monday. And I said, well, couldn't you come in the summer when the kids are home? And couldn't you, how about a longer weekend? Like you can spend more time with the kids. Kay's personality was very strong, a very strong personality. You know, you, you just, it's like underneath a wrath would come through and she was very antagonizing on that of of me and being angry with me and then uh, I didn't know what to say so there was the summer they did come visit it was a very odd visit she dominated a lot of stuff she came in wasn't interested in seeing the new house and she planned oh, we're gonna go see a movie and then we're gonna go it was orchestrated like I could feel this flow from her of a dominance so to speak and unfortunately I felt like a child when I was with her. Mm. Suddenly I started feeling like, and that's how it always was. When we visited her, she had everything planned, the whole menu. She would plan the menu, everything. She knew where, everything that we were going to eat. My, my son didn't like something. She chastised him, you know, made, made fun of him for not doing something. So this personality is kind of started coming out of anger or somewhat, or this, the tone in her voice and just more of a, this is what we're going to do. And, um, and I thought, I am not going to drink. Because after in 2006, I had consulted with a, a, a great aunt that I had met very close. And I, so things are kind of unraveling for me with this great aunt telling me what, what Kate was like. I had a cousin who was saying, well, let me tell you what she's really like. That she is a closet alcoholic, a great liar. This is, and I, I'm, I'm, can't believe this is happening where that's that i i can't believe this is what i'm hearing that this person who was coming for visits in the early stages of 2000s here and loving art fairs wonderful great you know, we're having a great time with a great time with the kids and suddenly now i'm seeing the alcoholism coming and my cousin saying well you not drinking with so what was was a great relationship she said as long as they were drinking she was her drinking buddy and then so they can because then my cousin just felt the connection with her and that when my cousin said I don't, I don't want to do this anymore then that collapsed and she said that that relationship she said then she didn't like that ended for some reason and same thing after i was born with her Kay's sister she just pushed her away and they kind of reconnected with with me but now it's starting to that that relationship's not going and so same thing here is i'm refusing in 2007 when they're here not to drink and I'm not going to drink, but she has a whole bottle of wine for herself. And at the end of the dinner, Bob says, would well, you have any after dinner drink? Sure. I got some Kahlua. I can bring something out. And so that's what we did. And I brought, especially these little glasses and oh, these, you know, these glasses are so small. She says, you know, oh my God, what, what don't you have anything bigger? <laughs> mm. And so when I took him to the airport, I, I, I looked at Bob and I, and I knew this was the end. This, this is not going to happen anymore. We're that much farther to New Jersey. You know, it's longer for us to drive. The kids are getting older. They're, they're getting into activities. And you know, when they left, I just got in the car and I let loose and I just cried in front of my kids. I just cried. And I told them why. I said, I, 
just grandma's different. You know, grandma doesn't, she doesn't, she's just different. Things are just different. You can kind of feel different. And I'm sad. I'm really sad. I'm sad to see them leave. I, I'm scared I won't see them again and, and these feelings I'm having. And after that, that was kind of sure enough where it was you can feel the, the the slow disconnect of 2009 and 2010. It was, I, I just, I, I don't understand. The phone calls are shorter. They're not, they're only in the evenings. They're, she's not, she's more intoxicated, it would sound like. Again, the tape loop, and so my sister-in-law had emailed and you know, what, did you have a falling out? And I said, no, there was there was no falling out. So, Kay in 2010 is fabricating the story that she and her sister had a fight, and I took sides. I took the side of her sister, and so that's why we're not we're not talking, mm -hmm. which is absolutely not the case because I'm sending photos of the kids, everything they're doing, and you know, it, it was. Nope, I you know, and I said to my sister, I'm I'm just really not interested in in all of this. So I'm not interested in this all of this family thing. Whatever she's got going, you know, I need to be positive. Barbara and Kay emailed back and forth, but only a little bit. Barbara called Kay, but she wasn't answering the phone, so Barbara just left messages. But Kay never returned the calls. Barbara offered for Kay and Bob to come to their home in Michigan in 2011, but. Kay made the excuse that Bob didn't have any time. That became the excuse for every offer for a visit Barbara extended. Barbara sent flowers to their home for the holidays, but she was informed they could not be delivered. No one was there. Barbara emailed her half-brother asking where Bob and Kay were. Unbeknownst to anyone, the pair had gone to Florida, but hadn't told a soul that that was their Christmas plan. Barbara told me, she had noticed in recent years the Christmas cards that arrived in the mail for the kids had gift checks in them, but the written tender was penned in Bob's handwriting, not Kay's. Barbara tried sending email cards to Kay, the cute little moving graphics and music type, but the electronic readings were never opened online. In 2013, Barbara learned she had breast cancer. She started chemotherapy in December of that year, enduring eight rounds of treatment, followed by multiple rounds of radiation going into 2014. Barbara did not share any of her battle with breast cancer with Kay. What Barbara needed was positivity in her life, which she didn't think Kay could provide, so she called her Aunt Judy, Kay's sister, who had always been supportive. We had a strong relationship, and I just wasn't thinking about it. Um, my son was very angry at the time. He's angry because he thought that I got the breast cancer from Kay. So I'm trying to we're trying to balance, and Jim's trying to keep a family of making sure a person's going to piano lessons, and, you know, AJ, I can't go to AJ's concert. He's playing too, but I can't do that. I can't. We have, we're trying to keep the sanity of, uh, and, and basically, I'm not existent because in chemo, you're just, you're not there. I'm just not mentally there. I'm in a fog all the time. And so that's kind of what 2014 was like with radiation, and you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking of her. I just wasn't thinking of her. And so I think about 2014, it must have started when well, my son said, "Well, did did you did anything come from Grandma and Grandpa?" And I said, "Well, finally did. I think after Christmas, like, oh yeah, you finally did get something, but everything was in Bob's handwriting." And then 20, 2015, apparently they sold their house and moved to Arizona, and I, I didn't know about it until I got a card in the mail saying one of those pictures of here's our new address. And then 2015, a, a little bit of correspondence, not, not much, because at this point, Kay's brother's trying to reach out to her, and she's refusing to take his phone calls. Mm. And Because he, he would call his sister Judy and say, why? I'm calling, and I can hear her there. And Bob's saying, no, she's not here. Bob doesn't, no, she doesn't want to take your phone calls. So she's she is now... At this point in 2015, keeping him away, keeping Judy away, and keeping me away. Mm -hmm. Not really, and She's not taking phone calls. From her life. Yes. Know. Yes, she is. Yeah. Yes, she is. And I feel sad, but at the same time, I'm trying to keep myself together. <laughs> I'm yes. trying to get my own life together. I, I'm, I'm dealing with everything in my life. And, uh, and so then in 2016, my son is graduating from high school. So I, I do send out an invitation. I get he gets 
a check from grandpa. Grandpa sent, wrote everything and, and sent everything, 2016. And then in 2017, and for my birthday, my husband gives me 23 and me. Because he thinks that, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we can do some, some testing here. Maybe you can find other relatives or do something. And I look at it and um, it sits on my desk in the kitchen for months. <laughs> and it even in, I think it was March, and my husband said, Are you, I'm really sorry. I am so sorry I'm getting you this. Maybe I, maybe I pushed you too much. Maybe I, no, no, I, I, I really, yeah, I should do this. I should do this. So I think I must have sent it off probably in about, I, th I think it was April or May. And I send it off. And then the beginning of May, uh, my aunt calls me and says she just received an email. Kay has passed away. There was no phone call. Bob didn't call. She was looped in with a, a group email of other people just saying that she had passed away. So at this point, I think the cancer may have come back. I, I was thinking I, maybe I should reconnect, but I, my head's not into it. She's, she's hurt, done so much to hurt me that I, I've invested so much into it, sending flowers, begging her to come for Christmas, begging her to come. No, he doesn't have time, won't come. I'm out. Uh, I, I've, I, can't, I can't do this. I even called my brothers and they both had divulged things to me that... I had no, I was not aware of. They had, they had issues, but they could not get Kay to bring out her issues. And it does seem, it seems that she was, she had come from what I found out was an abusive mother who, after Kay was born, was just kind of checked out. She was an alcoholic. And so basically, my Aunt Judy had kind of helped raise Kay, taking her clothes shopping and, and, and such. So and then when Judy went off to college, well, things you know, just got really bad because there was nobody home but Kay. And her mother was was very, was not kind to her, let's put it that way. Just mm -hmm. very, not, not very kind. And the relationship was really bad. And as... So let me ask you, did you, did you end up going to her funeral? So what happened was, no, because there was no funeral. Oh, wow. And there was no obituary. And there, there was nothing. There was just, you know, nothing. And... Had I been a little bit stronger, I think I would have I would have gotten on the plane and, and gone to Arizona. Barbara had submitted her DNA sample to 23andMe around the time of Kay's death. When her results came back a short time later, they revealed that Barbara is half Jewish. Something wasn't adding up. Kay had always said in her interviews with the social workers at the time of Barbara's adoption that her birth father was of English descent. Barbara said her world was rocked by the news that her Presbyterian upbringing wasn't aligned with her Jewish descent, and she tried to process things for a long while. In 2020, Barbara received a 23andMe message from a man in Canada who could see in their DNA match that they were first cousins or something close to that. Their parents might be siblings. The man asked about some specific family surnames that he knew of, searching to see if Barbara knew those same names at all. The names were unfamiliar to Barbara. Barbara explained the situation with her birth mother and her own adoption, sharing her surname and asked the stranger if the story made any links in his mind. He said no. There were no relationships in his family that originated in the Detroit, Michigan area. They could not figure out how their parents were related to one another. Barbara reached out to Kay's husband, Bob, to ask for some old pictures Kay had shown her more than 20 years before, one of which Kay had said Barbara's birth father was in. Barbara recalled that every time she asked Kay about her birth father, the woman always sidetracked the conversation. She said the whole story was too painful to discuss, so Barbara was forced to move on. So in this mail comes this packet with pictures I have never seen before. Oh my gosh, Kay's standing next to this boy and she's got this cute shorts like they have in the 60s, little sh plaid shorts, her hair and, and a bow tie and like, a, oh my God, that's me. You know, how I dress, like a little preppy. You go, oh my God, you know, neat and clean. And that's how she was like, oh, that's me. But who is this man? And, and they're, they're at the beach and she's got, he's got a swimsuit on and these beautiful pictures, black and white. But then I turn the back of it over and it says his name. His name really was Fred. And he had the last name, huh? So I Google him 
and find out he had died in the fall of 2018 and he's not Jewish. <laughs> I'm reading this obituary of this man. So the timing just could not be my father because he went into the army right after high school. So they went to high school together. They did go to high school together in Detroit. Okay. So then I thought, well, all right, well, let me, wait a minute. And I read the obituary of his father and who died a few years before that. And no, it doesn't mention anything about being Jewish or his faith or I'm just, my world is spinning at this point of everything that I knew. I realized naming this man Fred as my father is not my father. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, she lied to me. I had given her every opportunity all those years of the visits and the sitting down for breakfast before the art fair and we're doing things. That you had the opportunity to tell me the truth and you never did. And this is a lie? I'm half Jewish? <laughs> you know, <laughs> her increased alcohol consumption after your return was part of her dealing with trying to lie to you about what she had been through? I think so. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, I also contacted her best friend and I said, I said, well, you know, I, I discovered that I'm, I'm half Jewish. I said, was Fred Jewish? She said, well, you know what? I'm going to, I'll call you back. So a couple of days later, she calls back. Bob is livid. He, she said, he is really upset that this was a lie, but that, and he did a lot of covering up for her alcoholism. Barbara's first cousin could not figure out what their relation was at all. Barbara joined Ancestry DNA, but didn't submit a DNA sample. She did research down the rabbit hole on the Canadian cousin's whole maternal family tree back to their roots in Russia. Later, Barbara narrowed her search down to two men who could be her birth father. But this guy Kay called Fred was not showing up as a connection at all. Barbara recruited a search angel to help with her research. And she comes back and says, are you sitting down? I think this person is your father. Well, I had no idea. I didn't think about that one. So again, I'm trying to email this HA and he's not replying whatsoever. I'm being ghosted by him. It's not replying. So I gave 23 me to both my children because I thought this would kick H.A. in the butt and to get him to show him that his cousin, my father, has grandchildren, has relations. You know, they we're all connected. We are. He's connected to my children. So, and so my son does it immediately. My daughter, well, she's kind of dragging her feet, but my when my son does it, and he's calls me in February of, of of this year. Who's this person? Well, do you remember AJ? This is this is person. This is and that night I sent another email, another message on 23Me to HA. Yes, as you can see, my son is we really are connected. Are you in relations to this person who I who I, the genealogy the angel thinks is my birth father? And he says, comes back this time He's even giving me his email address. AJ is saying he's being more forthcoming suddenly of being more, yes, he's my cousin and I know his his two brothers and you know, you know, here's my email, contact me, you know, and, and I thought, okay, which I did immediately and I don't hear from him and I don't hear from him and finally, it was last month, a couple months ago, my husband says, let's just, let's just call him. Let's just call this supposedly birth father or let's call him. He's in Canada. But my husband, he says, so he spent an hour on the phone with this man. And this man seems to say, no, I'd, I've never been to the, I've never been to that border. I don't know anything about it. I'm so naive. I don't, I don't party. I don't, I don't I've never met anybody like that. I'm, but he's asking questions. But is she happy? Or so what was the story of her birth mother? And what's her name again? And he gives it to him. And I thought, gotta be it. Maybe this is, maybe he is. Mm -hmm. And I don't hear from him from this HA, I send him a message and don't hear, and I haven't heard from him. And then I'm starting to question and doubting, maybe he's not my birth father, but I feel at this point, there's only two people that could be my birth father on this tree. So either this man in Canada is either A, a first cousin or my father. And I'm not this sure where to go with it. Uh, HA is a cousin. So he is cousins with very weird with my birth father okay got so you. so do you end up connecting yeah, so, with your birth father tell me nope nope happens. nope right now after the 
the the talk that my husband had with David, his name is David. This David just kept saying, "I don't, I don't think I, I've never, I've never met anybody else. I don't, I don't know what you. It can't be me, you know. Why is the genealogy angel thinking it? I'm the birth father. It's not me. It's not me." But DNA doesn't lie. And the thing is, is that we took a picture of my son, put it next to David's picture that we saw found on the internet, and boy, are those two very similar. They, my son, looks so similar. Very wavy hair. And at this point, I, I'm not sure what, what avenue to do. I might, I might just need to I don't know, pick up the phone call and call H A or to say, you know, he really is. You know, I, I'm in a standstill here. I, I want nothing to do with anybody. I just want a story. I just want the story. Yeah. I want, I want nothing. I don't bother anybody. I just, I understand the sensitivity of this. I, I, I understand what impact. I don't want to make an impact. I just. I need something in my life. And, you know, the adoptees, we could go out one way and just shut the door. It's very difficult because also last year was my daughter came to me and she said, Mom, I think you need a therapist because mm -hmm. it was impacting my relationship. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry with Kay, deeply angry. I, I, I physically felt it. I physically felt the weight of my chest. I felt the weight of my heart. I just was, I, it was engulfing me so much that I would cry or I would just, and she said, I think you just need to get this out. You need to work through this. This, this anger can't, you can't keep doing it. You, at some point you got to figure out how to, what to do, make peace, do something. I don't, so I've been in therapy since since last August, mm -hmm. and, and I um, my therapist is a, an adoptee as well, and oh, it's wow, been that's rare. It is, and I googled trying to find somebody in the Grand Rapids area, and and found her, and I just spilled, I just spilled, and mm -hmm. the reception was so nice, and she said, oh, "You know what? Just a minute." And then she came back. She said, I can get you an appointment tomorrow. <laughs> can you oh, come in goodness. tomorrow, four thirty? Oh, wow. And I said, I will. I said, yep, I'll take, I'll take PTO if I have to. I will come in. And it was the beginning of it of how do I deal with being lied to? How do I deal with this? This, this I'm knocking on the door at this first cousin saying, tell me, help me. I, I want to connect with my birth father. And I, I get it. Either we are dealing with a community that does not envelop people i'm trying to be very political and say that, that it is the jewish community is very tight-knit and and for however reason these two people met in february and march of 66 and and this is the, the product of it and i'm coming to terms with that too being lied to that i really wasn't a product of love as Kay said you know you i was very much in love with the so I'm dealing with, with a lot of issues, and I, I get it. And every time I listen to those stories and podcasts, we just seem to be not cared for or listened to. And this has just been very difficult, and I don't know. I, I, should I just shut the door? Looking forward now on going back to this, this birth father, do I just let it go? Do I just let it go? And, and I, as I said to my therapist, I, a lot of things I have felt the last few years, feel physical like you physically feel ill you physically feel the weight of my of my chest i feel you're scared of being abandoned again because that's all i ever had was after my parents died my paternal side who i thought i just loved who lived in england said well you really weren't one of us mm. same thing with my mother's side you know i my favorite aunt after my mother died was not returning my phone calls and they all closed the door on me when I could have really used help. So everybody kind of left is what I'm saying. You know, you know, my, my mother-in-law, who was great in the beginning, now she's kind of abandoned me if she doesn't care for me. Um, not a lot of love anymore from them. So you, this constant abandonment of every, at every side that I felt very alone. I'm standing and I have nobody <laughs> to, to really lean on and, and accept Kay's sister and, and my husband. I don't have anybody else to say it's okay. And during this journey, how are you feeling? Yeah. Not one person said, how are you feeling? Do you, do you want to talk? I'm here for you. All of this felt, yes, everybody goes through these things, but it's exemplified even more so. You're, you're, 
even more, your feelings are even more so when you're adopted that you're already feeling abandoned. It's huge. It's even more so because you're even more sensitive and you just can't pull yourself up from it because you're already feeling beaten by everything. And at this point, my half brothers haven't heard from them in years. And I mm. probably assume that they don't want a relation if their father doesn't want to have a relationship with me with us. That's why should they? Then they can't. Wow. So. Well, Barbara, I'm I'm really glad that you're in therapy for the whole thing. You've been through so much between the reunion with your birth mother and sort of discovering the lies, going through the process of learning that she was alcoholic, was hiding things, it was habitual, and also losing your parents and going through breast cancer and double mastectomy. You've had a lot to deal with, so... I could see how it would manifest physically. Like it's a it's a huge set of challenges in in a massive you know sort of burden in its collection in 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 its totality. And I'm glad you. And found it's so easy. For, you know, competent counselor that is able to help you through this. So that's really good. Oh, absolutely. I think I never realized. Maybe a lot of adopted to do this is be you just suppress everything. I don't want to deal with it right now. And it's, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. Mm-hmm. My thing that my children always go with my husband says, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And and that's, it's not fine because then it kind of, it comes up. At some point you can't keep pushing thing, your feelings away and they have to come up. It's good that we're doing this now that I think more people are understanding therapy, but um, this is why we're here as a community, right? This is why we try to bring our voices together so that we can be supportive of each other right this is right a recognition of the fact that as adoptees we were just as you said transacted into another family without sort of any of our consent and there's an opportunity for us to now stand up and support each other and i'm really glad that you were here to sort of share your journey i'm sorry that you ended up losing your birth mother in the way that you did but i'm glad that you're in therapy and I'm glad you were here to tell your story with me. So I got to thank you. For oh, that. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Damon. And, and I said, you know what? We're going to keep fighting. And I'm even in Michigan. We're going to keep fighting to get those files open because that's I, I, we need that. Absolutely. And, and all of these podcasts are helping each other of sharing their stories and saying, you know what? I'm with you or I understand you, you know what we're with each other. So thank you so much for for giving me this this time. Of course. My pleasure. You take care, Barbara. All the best. Hang in there, okay? Uh, okay. Thank you, Damon. All right. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Hey, it's me. Barbara endured quite a bit. She grew up in a family with parents who were brought together as refugees from World War II. Barbara was able to identify her birth mother using a court-appointed confidential intermediary, and at first, her heart was full from the deep connection she had made to a woman she spoke with by phone. Over time, their visits were overtaken by Kay's domineering personality, and Barbara was left with hangovers from alcohol consumption. Suffering losses of her adoptive mother and father, and later her birth mother, due to alcoholism and undisclosed illnesses, Barbara has been left with only her loving husband and her children after multiple family members have turned their backs. I'm really glad that Barbara is in therapy. There is a lot to sort through in every adopted person's journey, and she is no exception given the litany of unanswered questions she lives with. Finding adoption competent therapists is really important for an adopted person's recovery, and I hope that if you need a therapist, you can find one with adoption competency near you. I'm Damon Davis, and I hope you found something in Barbara's journey that inspired you, validates your feelings about wanting to search, or motivates you to have the strength along your journey to learn. Who am I, really? 